Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Oxford Martin School. My name's Charles Godfrey. I'm the director. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you on this uh, really horrible, wet uh, afternoon, evening. Thank you so much for coming out for what's going to be a fascinating uh, talk and discussion, how can we build a sustainable economy? And this is based around a book um, that has just been published by Dieter Helm, Sir Dieter Helm, who's, um, who will be speaking first. And let me introduce Dieter. Dieter is Professor of Economic Policy here in Oxford and a fellow of New College. And Dieter is an expert on energy, on utilities, infrastructure, on their economics and how they should be regulated. And has been outstandingly influential in UK policy in all those areas. He's also a lead thinker around the concept of natural capital and what it means to protect assets for future generations. And Dieter was the independent chair of the Natural Capital Committee for, uh, I think, about 10 years. And again, hugely influential. And for this and many other things, Dieter was knighted in uh, 2021. Um, he is a prolific author. And I don't have time to read out all the books that Dieter has written. I'll mention The Carbon Crunch and Natural Capital as two great reads. And um, I, I also think of Dieter as a public intellectual in the way that that is respected perhaps more in continental Europe than in the UK, willing to get out there and talk about difficult subjects. Um, a few other things about Dieter. Dieter is also an entrepreneur. He set up Aurora, which is now, I think, the largest energy analysis firm in Europe with over 500 experts. Um, he cares passionately beyond um, theoretical natural capital about the countryside. Um, Dieter grew up on a mushroom farm in rural Essex, I believe. He's vice president of the Exmoor Society and of the local wildlife trust here. And if you want to know more about Dieter, there's a fabulous profile of him in the Financial Times in 2018, which I do encourage you to Google. You'll meet Dieter's dog there. And from that, I know that he enjoys fishing on Exmoor, and uh, he eats only seasonable veg vegetables he grows in his house in the Cotswolds. So Dieter is going to speak for 15 minutes or so, and is then going to have a conversation with Dimitri Zengelis. And welcome, Dimitri. Um, Dimitri read PPE here in Oxford at St. Hughes, and then went on to do a master's in uh, economics at Bristol. Um, Dimitri's done a, a huge range of different things in the private sector, in the government sector, and in the academic sector. And I'm just going to pick out a couple. Um, for a while, he was head of economic forecasting at, uh, at the Treasury and had senior advisory roles with both uh, the Chancellor and the Prime Minister. He headed the Stern Review team and was one of the lead authors of the Stern Review. Um, Dimitri was head of climate policy at the Grantham Research Institute at LSE, and he's still a senior visiting fellow there and at the Bennett Institute for Public Policy. In, um, in Cambridge, and among many other senior advisory roles, he's been chief economist at Cisco and has worked with Chatham House and is today a partner at Capital Generation Partners. So as I said, first we'll hear from Dieter, then Dieter will be in conversation with Dimitri, and then we'll go for 20 minutes question and answers from the floor, and we'll finish uh, pretty much bang on quarter past six. Dieter. Thank you, Charles, for reading out a list of all my sins. Um, thank you very much. And thank you very much for everyone for coming along this evening. And thank you to the Oxford Martin School for organizing this. Um, what I'd like to do in just 15 minutes is obviously not cover all the dimensions of the sustainable economy, but to pick out some of the key themes. And then hopefully we can explore those further uh, with Dimitri and in Q&A thereafter. I come at this having spent quite a long time, and I suspect many of you have done, looking at all the terrible things we're doing to our planet and how unsustainable many 
of the things that are going on are. So my talk and my book is premised on what we are currently doing is not sustainable. And it's premised on the logical corollary of that, which is since it isn't sustainable, it will not be sustained, which is something most people don't step to from the observation that it is uh, unsustainable. And you know this stuff, but I just want to remind you of just how far off course we are. So a couple of very quick slides. Uh, this shows what's been happening to the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere since, in fact, 1980. But you can choose 1990 as the kind of date from which the targets refer. It's pretty linear. It just keeps going up. It tilts up a bit more at the end. And it's two parts per million addition to the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere every single year since 1990, without a blip. Anyone who thinks we're on a path to addressing climate change, and anyone in particular who thinks that 27 cops are the way to go, well, I think you need to think again. Because if this is what people had in mind back in 1990, or 1992 with the Framework Convention, I'm sure that they would be uh, somewhat chastened by the outcome. And behind that lies another uh, feature of our unsustainable world. People get terribly excited about how many wind farms we're building. We've got to 13 gigawatts in the North Sea, which is a hell of an achievement. Only China's got more. But 80% of the world's fuel is fossil fuels, 80%. And much of the rest is hydro and nuclear. And we haven't really started on taking down that 80% fossil fuels. And if you go back 20, 30, 40 years, it isn't much different. And the demand for oil keeps going up. It's about 102 or 104 million barrels a day. Okay, that's the amount of consumption. All this stuff about we're going to get out of fossil fuels or just stop oil, right? you know, it's not going in that direction. And by the way, just an aside, it will be such a devastating uh, catastrophe for the world's economies if you literally just stopped oil tomorrow morning, that it's not feasible either. But that's an aside. So on the climate change side, it's pretty unsustainable. And it's much more difficult to spell out the detail on the biodiversity side, but that's pretty unsustainable too. You know, and it partly explains that increase in the parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere, because although it's true that some things have been done about emissions, and of course the lockdowns led to sharp falls in emissions, we have to remember that at the same time as we've been pumping out more emissions, we've been destroying the ability of the Earth to absorb carbon. Sequestration is the other side of the equation. It's what our world does to balance out the stock of carbon in the atmosphere. And if you look what we're doing to our rainforests, if you look what we're doing to our marshes, to our oceans, and especially to our soils, that's also a key part of the equation. And it's not just about burning bits of the Amazon to clear for agriculture and other activities. You just need to go on uh, Google Earth and have a look at the nickel mining in Indonesia for the minerals for the low carbon technologies or the cobalt mine in or cobalt mines in the Congo I'm told I've never tried this you can see the child labor from space but these things are pretty devastating for our natural environment too and so this is an easy idea we're going to switch to our electric cars they're zero emissions I've got one of these things it's very good for virtue signaling but when you actually go back through the supply chain, electric cars are not going to stop the destruction that's taking place, even if they're going to make some difference to the total emission package. If I just put those up, I could put lots more to establish the point that what we're doing is not sustainable. So the question I ask myself is, what would the sustainable economy actually look like? What would it look like to live in a world which was sustainable going forward? I'll come back to whether we're ever going to get there, but it's still a very interesting question. What are the principles 
what are the rules, what are the consumption patterns which would be identified with an with a, a economy which we could pass on to the next generation with clean ethical hands. And there are three core foundations which I set out in my book. The first is, when you think about the next generation, we can't simply think about them as GDP and utility. Indeed, it's not our job to make the next generation happy. I suspect that for you, for those amongst you who have children, I suspect although you'd like your children to be happy, what you want to do is endow them with a set of resources, education, human capital, and then have an environment to, so that they can choose how to live their lives and how to live good lives. We have to include citizens as the core component of this economy, not just people as consumers. Consumption's important, but citizens are the core. Secondly, we don't know what the future's gonna look like. We don't know the expected utility in 25 years' time for the economists amongst you. In my lifetime, I've gone from my typewriter to a powerful computer in my pocket. I had no idea there'd be an internet, no idea I had a mobile phone, no idea even there'd be fax machines, if you even know what those things are, uh, when I was doing my doctorate. And trying to predict the future forward 20, 30 years ahead of my doctorate would have been pretty uh, inconceivable to get that in any way right. So what you need is you need resilience. You need to ensure that the core assets are in good shape. And I'll come on to that. Uh, you need to maintain those so that they form the framework within which whatever technologies out there will uh, help people take their lives forward. So uncertainty is of the essence of the sustainable economy, not expected utility. Citizens are the core, not utility maximizing consumers. Okay? The third thing is, it's about assets, not primarily flows. Almost all economics, all GDP is about flows. This is about the stocks, the stock of carbon in the atmosphere, the stocks in our ecosystem, the housing stock, the educational stock of human capital, the uh, health stock of the population, and the ecosystems themselves and the climate from the atmosphere. So I focus on ensuring that the stocks are passed on to the next generation. Of course, we want the stocks because they've got flows associated, but I have very little truck with cost-benefit analysis and the idea that you can value the natural environment by looking at willingness to pay, willingness to accept, and the usual tools of economics. I don't start from that direction. So there's are three quite radical departures. And this is all to leave the next generation I make it more formal, the definition, but to leave the next generation with a set of assets at least as good as we had, probably we've got quite a lot of detriment to make up, so they can choose how to live their lives. And that means that certain assets have to be passed on which are core assets in perpetuity, and it's the balance sheet that we pass on, the doomsday book to the next generation that we pass on that really matters. And since these are assets in perpetuity, you can't depreciate them. This is about capital maintenance and at current cost. And you might think, although that's a technical accounting point, it's absolutely radical because capital maintenance is not an investment. You don't borrow for capital maintenance. You do it out of your day-to-day -day spending. You fix the tiles on the roof of your house. You paint the gutters. You paint the windows. You do the fix the holes in the road because that's what it takes to keep those assets intact. It's pay as you go, not pay when delivered. And that should come out of our current income before our spending is struck. And that has very radical consequences to what is the sustainable level of consumption. And you have to, in addition, provide for resilience to shocks so that not only are you passing on those assets to the next generation, at least a good state, you're making sure that the bound of uncertainty, the safe limits, is within the frame. It comes to biodiversity, you don't just try and work out the threshold by which a species can reproduce itself. 
you work out a safe margin on top because you're really not quite sure. And of course, resilience is about uncertainty going forward. That means that you and I, because we are the only things that the economy ultimately is, businesses are doing stuff for us. Businesses don't pollute for fun. They do it because we buy the oil, the gas, the coal, produce products, etc., etc. Farmers don't pollute the land for fun. They do it because we buy the food and we want the cheap food. So we have people, the economy, to pay for the capital maintenance. We have to pay for the pollution we're causing. And to the extent that we wish to enhance the assets to make up for the damage we've done, we have to save to invest. And saving is foregone consumption. By now, you've probably got to the point of thinking nobody in their right minds is going to vote for this. Actually, in their right minds, they would vote for this. But this tells you why you're living beyond your sustainable means, because you're not paying for these things. In the recent example of the school roofs, governments propose an opposition to borrow to fix the roofs from this guy. No, no. You have to provide schools in perpetuity to each generation, and you have to maintain them. And the maintenance comes out of current income, and that is not for borrowing to lumber the next generation with the cost of maintaining the assets which you caused to depreciate and you shouldn't have done because that's capital consumption. And that brings us to the macroeconomics of this as well as the personal economics of this. If on the 22nd of November, the Chancellor stands up and provides his autumn statement, and he wishes to provide a statement which guarantees that we are pursuing the sustainable economy, if he wants to do that, he has to split what he's doing into a current account, like a business account, and a capital account, a balance sheet. And on the current account, there's, of course, current spending, health, education, all those kind of things, the current spending of that, plus providing for the capital maintenance, fixing the potholes in the road, and doing all the other maintenance of those assets the next generation has in mind, and think the radical consequence of that, paying to address climate change should not be an investment, it should be capital maintenance. We should be paying as we go to keep that climate by maintaining the atmosphere constant through time. Okay? And when he's deducted the capital maintenance from the current expenditure and compares, uh, and the revenues are the tax and his other amounts, that's what's left for spending more generally. That's not what he's going to say. And when we have talk about whether there's room for more public expenditure or more tax cuts, I bet you this isn't the way the accounting's done. And on the capital account, assets equal liabilities. We do not need to value assets in perpetuity. You don't need to value nature with a price because you're not going to sell it. You're not going to depreciate it. You're only interested in the costs of maintenance of that nature. Um, the liabilities offset the offset exactly against the assets. And the only thing you borrow for is new enhancements, new assets. That's radically different from how we have gone about building up ever bigger liabilities in debt for the next generation to inherit or require inflation to write it off and default upon. So it would be a very, very different autumn statement uh, uh, come um, uh, the 22nd of November. So where does that leave us? Is this all, oh my God, we've all got to wear hair shirts, cut our expenditure, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Well, yes and no. There is no escaping the conclusion that the sustainable level of consumption is significantly below the actual current level of consumption. That if we did the capital maintenance, if we paid for the pollution we caused, there will be less room for our spending. And if we saved a bit of our income to pay, to provide for the investment, for the enhancements, that comes off it too. You can't carry on the current consumption path and pretend you're being sustainable. Right? How much the adjustment is, how long you take to make the adjustment, 
and how you look after poorer people in that framework. I have a whole chapter on the social justice dimensions of this are important components, as is the constitutional framework which makes this stick. Uh, but the overall claim is the sustainable level of consumption is lower. Now, some people in the environmental movement conclude from this that we want to have no growth. It's not just we need to cut our cloth to our sustainable requirements, but it's also the case that we can't go on growing uh, our standard livings into the future. That's nonsense. It's true we have to come from this level down to this level to get to a sustainable consumption path, but economic growth is caused by technical progress. And you only have to look around to see the sheer scale of technical progress coming our way. Quantum computing, genetics, synthetic biology, digitalization of virtually everything, AI, fiber, it makes it looked like a picnic in the park, how I got from my typewriter to my mobile phone in my pocket now, to what is potentially out there coming forward. And that, yes, does make us better off. So it's about getting onto a sustainable path, and then, of course, within the bounds of remaining to do the capital maintenance, enjoying what benefits that economic growth may bring properly defined. This isn't GDP growth. GDP doesn't really figure in this frame. So let me conclude. As I said earlier, you may rightly observe that this is going to be a pretty hard sell. Right? But that's not what the voters want. They want tax cuts, they want more public expenditure, and they are quite happy to borrow and let the next generation pay for it. Everywhere. Right? To advocate what I suggest here would probably be a kiss of death at the next election. Okay? But that doesn't change the context. That just says we're not on a sustainable path and we're not doing enough capital maintenance. We're borrowing for capital maintenance when it should come out of current income. We're not paying for pollution and therefore we are on that unsustainable path. And the question that arises, which is the subject of the book I'm now writing, is called How It Ends. Because it does end. What is unsustainable will not be sustained. It's not whether we become sustainable. It's whether we do it ex ante now and take reasonable steps in that direction or it's forced upon us ex post. And many of you will have contemplated what the world looks like with half the biodiversity and three degrees warming. That's part of being forced back onto what will be a much uh, poorer but nevertheless inevitable path. So it's out there to do. It's not rocket science to work out what's required. It's not the conventional economic way of thinking about this, but it's my best shot at what I think the sustainable economy would look like. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. That was uh, incredibly clear and very sobering. Dimitri, I'm going to hand mm. over to you now to have a conversation with Dieter on some of these issues. Thanks very much, Charles. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, I thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to read, to read your book, which I found um, both incredibly thoughtful and incredibly thought-provoking. Um, it covers a lot of ground. Um, it's very much, I would say, in line with the sort of British empiricist tradition. It's an ambitious framework, but it's very practically based. It's designed to work. Um, it, uh, you know, we, we can quibble about whether or not you misrepresented Frank Ramsey, but I think we probably bore half the audience. Uh, certainly that half that isn't steeped in economics. Um, but I think your focus on the next generation, I think, is the right one. It, 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 it yields the same... Uh, outcome in a much clearer way, and I think you're right also to point out this isn't about expected utility, this isn't about consequentialist outcomes in the future for the reasons you've given. We just don't know what those will be, and it's no point us trying to second-guess them, although I would say we can steer them, and that's something that we can come back to, but we can't predetermine them in any, uh, in, in, in any uh, um, um, deterministic sense. 
Uh, I think your invocation of a sort of a Martia Sen type uh, capabilities approach, whereby people can uh, have the opportunities to live their lives and flourish, I think, again, is also uh, a very fruitful one. And I agree absolutely and wholeheartedly that this is about core systems. It's about uh, preserving and maintaining primary assets. It's one of the reasons I helped set up the Wealth Economy Project at the University of Cambridge, which focuses on natural capital and, uh, and social capital. I think you gave some really good insights as to how we can best do that. Um, so, I mean, you know, I, I, I'm... In a sense, if I carry on like this, I'll probably bore the whole audience. You came here for something a little bit more than just backslapping and bonhomie. Uh, but there's, you know, 90% of this is, is, is stuff that I thoroughly... Uh, agree with. I agree we, we are living beyond our means um, and we do need uh, to borrow only for the enhancement of, uh, of assets and I think that's right. Uh, certainly capital maintenance and current expenditure should come out of current spending. So where could I be a little bit provocative on what elements can I disagree? Well I think there are some elements where I'd like to sort of to probe a little bit uh, and, and I suppose one place to start is the notion uh, or the need I think, to distinguish between financial debt uh, and real debt. Mm -hmm. Because I'm not convinced that financial debt is actually real debt. You, in your book, you, you invoked, uh, uh, you, 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 you invoked um, uh, Robert Barrow, um, who famously said that government bonds are not net wealth. And I think by the same token, government debt is not net debt. We're not really borrowing from future generations. We're borrowing from each other. It's a, it is a claim on future taxpayers who will then have to repay other future taxpayers. Uh, you're, uh, you're all part of, but most of you are part of both those camps. You're both taxpayers, but you also have pensions and insurance and so on, and those are the entities that buy the government bonds. Um, so it's not an intergenerational distribution. It is one that should make us worry if we think those bonds cannot be repaid because they are funding unsustainable consumption. But you should worry about that as much from the perspective of a bondholder as from a taxpayer. Um, something would be out of kilter. And it's certainly a worry from a single state um, uh, perspective. And I would wholeheartedly agree that the UK in particular has a problem with consuming too much and saving too little. And that has been a key part of this country's economic, relative economic decline. But of course, at the whole economy global level, to the extent that we can't be borrowing from Mars, um, those financial balances do have to balance. Okay, we, we, you know, we, are, not, we are not building up liabilities with uh, people outside the world. And this, I think, is where it starts to get a little bit interesting. Because I totally under, uh, agree that in the sense that we are living beyond our means, we are not investing in enough, uh, not only in enhancing our capabilities, but even maintaining those assets in perpetuity that, that, that Dieter talks about. But if you look at the drivers of this, it's not, obvi it's not obvious that at a global level this comes from a deficiency in desired saving. Certainly, I think that is the case in the UK, but it's not been the case in, in China, it's not been the case in parts of Asia, it's not necessarily the case in, in maybe in Germany or Holland. Um, and the evidence for that, this is just assertion, but the evidence for that is the fact that ex post, the global neutral real interest rate that balances savings and investment has been close to zero now for about two decades. And now there are reasons for that. People have looked into this, and some of them are quite obvious. In particular, uh, mass uh, industrialization and urbanization in China, spawning a middle class of peak uh, working age who save more, uh, more women in the labor force, the opening up of the Soviet Union and ex-Soviet countries. And of course, inequality. Rich people tend to save more than poor, and as you get more inequality, you get more savings. And this glut, if you like, of ex-ante savings, of desired savings, has served to push real interest rates really low. Now, to me, the question of interest here is, given that real interest rates the world over have, and I'm talking about policy neutral, neutral real interest rates, so you know, this is abstracting from quantitative easing and monetary policy and all the rest of it. And there are good studies as to kind of how you can try and do that. What, why on earth are we not investing? If there's free money to be had, you only have to look around you at the state of, you know, uh, the capital infrastructure in this country and other countries to wonder what on earth is going wrong uh, with our society where we're not, we're basically not recognizing anything that seems to have even, a, you know, a, the most marginal positive return because you could borrow and invest and make a, make, a, make a return on that. And I think here, actually, Dieter's book is really telling, because actually you go into some of the reasons for that in a way that I have to admit I had not thought of before. And I think 
um, your account of how increasingly we're moving into a world where there are more and more goods and services of a public good nature. They're either non-rival or non-excludable or a bit of both. And in particular, as the economy becomes digital, we are seeing more than that. So conventional markets based on marginal cost pricing simply don't work. And that requires more intervention. And that intervention requires a greater role for the state with all the risks associated with uh, the state getting it wrong as well. And I think you come up with some, some fantastic uh, institutional infrastructure to try and manage that. But it, it resonates with me because it makes me think, well, actually, yes, I think that may, that may be part of the explanation as to why society is not investing uh, at the level it should have done. And I'll end by kind of um, invoking another book, which I recommend if you haven't read it. It's Simon Sharp's book, Five Times Faster. And he makes the point, a similar point to Dieter's, but I think slightly nuanced, slightly different. He also makes the point about the need for public intervention in the kind of economy we're seeing. Um, but he talks about the dynamics. He talks about the fact that a lot of the technologies that we're going to need to clean up our economy are not ones that start cheap. They start expensive. But as you invest in them, as you deploy them, as you learn by doing, the costs start to come down radically. We may quibble about whether um, you know, solar PV is now cost competitive with fossil fuels when you take in you know, system, grid system balancing costs and intermittency. But the rate at which they've been falling, 90% over the last decade, suggests that if they're not already, they very soon will be. But they didn't start cost effective, and you wouldn't have got that, that reinforcing feedback whereby deployment breeds learning by doing, and economies of scale, because you have these massive plants in southern China to produce solar PVs or gigafactories for, for batteries, which reduces the unit cost of these items, which makes them cheaper, which makes it more likely you'll deploy them, which breeds more learning by doing. You've got this reinforcing feedback, and like all reinforcing feedbacks, they are perniciously difficult to project. You, know, you can't forecast something that is, uh, that, 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 that is, that is mutually reinforcing. Uh, it makes forecasting incredibly difficult, and it makes forecasts very path-dependent, and they don't converge on unique equilibria. All the stuff econ economists hate, because it makes a mockery of their models. Uh, and, you know, I'm as skeptical as you are. I mean, I've often been quoted as saying economists not only get the future wrong, they make the future wrong. Because to the extent that they're actually believed when they talk about how limited the technological options are and how eye-wateringly expensive this is going to be, um, agents behave as if that's true, and they make it a self-fulfilling prophecy by delaying the kind of investment and the kind of uh, deployment and behavioral change that's necessary to bring those costs down. So I think that sort of dynamic element, uh, you know, to quote Simon Sharp again, he says there is no level playing field. If you, if you have a level playing field in technologies, you will always end up with the incumbents winning out. They have the existing capital, they have the lobbying power, uh, they have, uh, you know, they, 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 you will end up with more efficient coal and more efficient uh, oil and gas. You will, you will not be able to have that leap, to, to quote Asimoglu and Agion, to kickstart the clean innovation machine. What does that mean? It means you, you need some intervention, powerful intervention up front to get the clean economy going until you reach such a point where it becomes so self-evidently in many cases uh, superior to the incumbent technology that you, you can take your foot off the sort of the policy pedal. But up front, you need some positive intervention. And where I slightly differ with Dieter is I'm a little bit more, in the Paul Romer sense, conditionally optimistic. I'm not complacently optimistic. I don't think we're going to do this. Uh, we are going to miss our targets. We are in grave danger as a society. But the tragedy of this is if we got our act together, we really could do this. That's the conditional optimism. Uh, it's certainly climate change, rather harder with biodiversity and natural capital. Climate change is actually the easy bit. It's not fundamentally a technological or an economic problem. It's primarily a political and behavioral problem, which doesn't, by the way, make it any easier. On the contrary, that's why it's so bleeding difficult. Uh, but that is the nature of the problem. I think a lot of this is about how we get the political economy. And you're, some, of the, some of the stuff in, in your book about you know, making this a just transition, recognizing the degree of disruption uh, that this will bring about, and trying to make sure that as many people are brought on board, if this is going to work, I think is is very much the right place to, to land. And again, to quote, uh, to quote Simon Sharp, the reason there isn't a, a level playing field, or the, you know, if, you, if you think you can 
adopt a technology neutral approach. And here I think there is a little bit of a difference because you see the role for intervention in terms of providing the governance infrastructure for some of these markets. But you're perhaps a little more skeptical about the role of governments in picking winners, given the sort of the lobbying and vested interest side of it, which is, which is absolutely valid. Um, but if you don't start picking winners, taking some risks, not all of which will come good, um, then what you'll tend to do is carry on with more of the same. Because the, no, the way our society is structured, we will keep doing things the way we've done them and follow the path of least resistance unless given a bloody good reason to make that change. And I think on that, we are, we are really fundamentally agreed. Let, let me come back on um, uh, uh, just a few of those points. Um, and just as a sort of aside, um, I'm not pessimistic or optimistic. I think I'm trying to be realistic about these things. And I have so many conversations, oh, that's all pessimistic, or you ought to be more optimistic. It, th this is too serious to try and work out what mood you're in. This is about um, uh, uh, just being uh, really forensic about both the state of the world we have and the options and their costs. Um, uh, on the... Uh, new technologies. Uh, I have a whole, I mean, I don't have time for a whole section on the public goods, of which R and D is by far the most important. Okay, and R and D will never be done properly by a market left to its own devices. No. That doesn't mean startups. I've done some of my own. Uh, don't have a massive role in that frame. But you need a supportive structure of institutions. Dare I say, of tax regimes. And you need core universities to make this stuff happen. And if, if, you, if I found that argument hard in the past, I just say the word vaccines, and then people get the point. Um, and it's fairly clear. So I don't think we disagree about that. Mm, no. The thing about R&D is it's fantastically wasteful, but some things work. Okay? That's why the private sector is not that interested, unless it's a you know, real startup with tax incentives and all that kind of stuff. But no problem on that, really. No, no. Okay? On the... The point about uh, the social justice, etc. So I try not in the book to abstract this problem of the sustainable economy from some of the other things that are happening in the economy simultaneously. So zero marginal costs is the big feature of our world going forward. That's what digitalization does. That's what AI does. It really changes the nature of these things. Now, from an infrastructure core asset point of view, they're already zero marginal cost, right? or quite close to. The whole characteristic of infrastructure is very high fixed and sunk costs and very low marginal costs. That's why the state is always involved in protecting the investors and why nationalization is often reached because the state cannot live up to its commitment to private investors to sustain the assets they put in place and not expropriate them ex post. Uh, I could talk to you about Thames Water at length as to how these issues now come to the fore. But this central point, now if that's true, and if digitalization is arriving at the speed which it looks to be, then many people are not gonna have the futures they think they are going, they think they're entitled to in the workforce. And that's why, for example, with modification, having thought through very carefully the cost and very strongly in favor in the book of universal uh, basic income as part and parcel of that. And only the state can guarantee that. It's not an option unless you want revolution um, when large parts of the population are uh, disenfranchised of the workforce. It's part and parcel of it. The transition, you call it a transition, I call it doing the capital maintenance, mm. The adjustment to the consumption is going to be part and parcel of that frame. So social justice isn't just the normal stuff about social justice. It's actually about how is it the state enables the population, the citizens, to have access to the basic social primary goods, these core assets, in order to choose how they live their lives. I would um, appall uh, many people I know uh, across Whitehall and say, for example, I think it's really bad that students have to pay for their education. Why? That should be a right of every citizen. Okay? Access to nature, access to the countryside, access to a decent climate, access to health. So it's not just I think that we should pay for the capital maintenance of these assets to pass on to the next generation. 
I think it's elemental to taking a citizen's view mm -hmm. that these things are what each of us qua citizen, regardless of where we're born, where we live, etc. in the society, should be entitled to. And dare I say it, that was the basic idea behind the welfare state after the Second World War. And that's not a political left-right point. It's simply saying what it is we all, as individuals, should be entitled to and what we owe each other to provide and to provide for the next generation. So that, that's in the zero marginal cost. A uh, couple of other quick points. On the cost falling, yeah, yeah, it's a great story. Moore's law just does this, right? And we just extrapolate it to any technology. Well, costs do fall as you apply technologies. But also, quite often, those who advocate particular technologies forget the full costs of their technologies, and sometimes they go up. Okay? So with my virtue signaling with my new, brand new electric car, if I really look at the costs of, through the full supply chain of producing a car which is sold to me as zero emissions. Do you, do you actually have an electric car? Yes, yes. I bought it, I bought it, I bought <laughs> it. Um, at extraordinary cost, I thought I've got to do this, right? <laughs> Um, but if you look at the mining that lies behind this and the scale that's to come, you look at the refining, you look at all these component parts, you look at the batteries, you look at the recycling, all those component parts. What I have concluded is that the old petrol golf I had was probably, I should have kept it rather than buy a new uh, uh, electricity. And all I'm saying is do think through the cost. The other point is some costs do go up. So the offshore wind farms who were bidding 35 pound a megawatt hour a year or two ago, are now saying we need at least 70, yeah. and in Ireland they're being awarded 86 pound per megawatt hour for a CFD. It's not clear these costs are gonna come down much more. And then of course, all the intermittent renewables exclude the cost of their intermittency. And in my cost of energy review, I recommended equivalent firm power for those who are you know, inane enough to be interested in the details of electricity markets. And of course, the renewables industry hate it because I'm suggesting that those who cause intermittency should pay for the intermittency to back it up. So when people say these technologies are cost competitive with gas, if only is my answer, mm. and I hope they will be. But that's where I differ from lots of people, and I think that the transition to net zero is going to be quite costly, and we ought to do it. But I object to people who say it's win-win, it's going to pay for itself, or, and this isn't meant a political point, but it is slightly political, the opposition spokesman on climate change at one stage said that the renewables were 10 times cheaper than gas, and then reduced it to three times. If that's true, we can end all the renewable subsidies now. In fact, we can get outside Parliament with a placard saying, stop charging customers the costs of the subsidies for renewables because they're cheaper than gas. It's not true, and that's why we have to support the subsidies and have to intervene to make those renewables happen. Final, final point on uh, debt. It's a big topic, mm. right? But you and I have a very different interpretation of what's happened over the last 20, 30 years. I think this is a credit cycle. I think monetary policy has been deliberately lax over the period. I think QE is quite close to printing money. And I think that the inflation we have now and the legacy of the debt overhang is a serious cost for running interest rates at a level which is not sustainable. And that's quite a different view from the view that this was a, a savings glut, etc. And I would argue it's also because inflation was very low because the Chinese transition allowed cheap goods to come into markets and depress prices. This is a huge academic debate, mm. but it matters how you think about that. But whatever you do think about that, looking forward to the costs of investment, you could either assume that the interest rate was like this, negative in real terms, and then it went up for a bit because of those nasty Russians, and it's coming down again to 2% or below going forward. Or like me, you can think that that was an aberration in the past, an abnormal economic period, and what we're doing is going back to normal interest rates, and I think about, for example, 5% interest as not higher for longer, but potentially higher forever. And the 10-year gilt rate is 4.4. 4. 
that's not tomorrow morning and a fall back below. But central bankers all believe they're going to get back to 2% inflation very shortly. I heard Andrew Bailey say that today. And this is just an aberration, and we can go back to these extremely low interest rates. I think not, but we will differ a lot on that and have a whole debate on that subject. But thank you very much for all your comments. You're welcome to have another go before <laughs> Please. We... Yeah, I mean, look, I, you, uh, why don't I start with a bit at the end? I mean, I, I, in many respects, I think you might find that we differ less than you might think. I, too... How disappointing. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> Let me try and spice it up. Um, I, you know, I, too, I think it's extraordinary that, um, you know, we've reached the point where real interest rates are as low as, as they are, um, and debt is as high as it is. And something's not right. What on earth are these bondholders thinking? Um, why are they lapping up government debt at you know, levels which you know, you're rightly worried about? You know, is this going to be repaid? Or will there be uh, an explicit or at least implicit default mm. through inflation? Surely the likelihood of one or other is a lot higher. Uh, and I think that's right. And yet, for some bizarre reason, and it's worth examining that bizarre reason, that is where a lot of this saving, whether you call it a glut or not, this saving has gone. It's not gone into building real, uh, you know, it's not gone into what you call capital enhancement. Mm. You know, investing in new uh, primary assets, whether they're infrastructure or natural capital. Um, and I think that is the more worrying aspect. And again, it goes back to the points I thought you raised, you know, the, 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 some of the questions that, that, that you rightly raised in your book. Um, why is it that at a time when, and here we do differ, I think, you know, as a matter of, pure ex post evidence uh, insofar as the global mutual real interest rate has been so low and the market for saving and investment globally has to balance, why has all this saving, and you know, whether it comes from QE or whether it comes from uh, you know, Chinese workers, why has all this saving gone into speculative uh, investments, into property and into government bonds, which are yielding zilch, and not gone into all these but, supposed but, opportunities. But let me give you an answer to that by coming back to my favourite subject of Thames water. <laughs> <laughs> you could not resist, could no, you? No, I can't <laughs> resist it, okay? So, when it was privatised, the idea was, with all the water companies, that there was a huge amount of investment to do. Very little investment had been done in the 80s, and there was a clear need to deal with the leakage, actually deal with the sewage, deal with the sewage works, mm. and create new water resources. So the private sector balance sheet was created. Actually, it was given cash injection, yeah. so it was better than naught. And the idea was the balance sheet would be used for real capital investment, which would fit my model because it's essentially enhancements, mm. right? Some of it would have been maintenance and shouldn't be called that form. Yeah. What happened was the real interest rate was negative, right? That means that borrowing was free. Yeah. So what? the owners, the successive owners of Thames have done. I think it was the original private. I think RWE owned it once. Macquarie owned Macquarie. it. Lots of, people, lots of people owned it. Okay. What it they the did hills. was to say, look, we've got this set of equity, this value of the company. Let's swap the equity for debt. Yeah. They mortgaged yeah. it. They went to the bank equivalently, to Binkley's bank, and said, how much will you lend me against these assets? And they borrowed the sum and paid it out as dividends. Right? And that's essentially where we are. 80% geared is Thames, right? And now it needs to raise equity because it's run out of mileage for this. And of course, the investors aren't in it for that game in the per current context. That's why it may go into administration, etc. Now, that borrowing doesn't go away. If you go down to the bank and say, I've got this house, some of you may be lucky enough to have a house that you own as opposed to rent. Um, I suspect many more of us will be renting in the future. You go to the bank and say, I paid off my mortgage, but look, how much will you offer me against the house, right? And I get lent half a million quid, right? And then I say, great, let's go and have a party. Yeah. <laughs> let's go and spend it. Yeah. Let's pay it out and enjoy the process. You don't end up with an economy that's sustainable at the end of that process. And that's why the book also has a long chapter on how to regulate these things properly, okay? But I think negative real interest rates are behind the great boom in private equity, the fantastic mortgaging of our economy, and now we're stuffed with yep. it. And recall, for the British economy, 
just in case you think, oh, well, we can, we can handle that. Almost all investment in the UK economy is foreigners. Right? Much of British industry is now owned by foreigners. Why? Because we run a current account deficit on the balance of payments, so we import more than we export. At one stage recently, it was 8% of GDP, as high as it's been during the Second World War, the last time. So we have to be lent that 8% of GDP to make the balance of payments add up. And what do we do? We sell the family silver. Even if you look at British quoted companies and look at their, their register, you will find they're mostly owned by foreigners. And why? Well, we have no savings. We live beyond our means yeah. from the current account point of view. The government is a net disaver. For British industry, profits equal dividends, pretty roughly, which means that we're not retaining earnings to reinvest. And well, we know what the consumers are up to and the position they're in. So if you do not want to save, and you want to, uh, uh, and you do not want to live within your, even your ordinary means, then you have to take out a bigger mortgage owed to foreigners through time. And that is not a sustainable yeah. framework. And that financial debt, which you distinguish from real debt, I understand the entirely point, but that financial <laughs> debt, the financialization of the economy, is a natural consequence of negative real interest rates and a balance of payments deficit. Yeah, and absolutely, I would agree, certainly from a UK perspective, we are, you know, we are, we are mortgaging our future to the extent that you know, uh, our foreign assets don't make the same returns as the increasingly large uh, assets owned by foreigners in this country, then we're going to constantly be paying more and more of our income out yeah. to foreigners. It's a, yeah. it's a matter of accounting. Yeah. Um, and certainly the UK but, but, clearly but, but has you're a savings right. problem. Other people do say. So if you look at the great economic transformation since the Second World War, mm. Germany, Korea, Japan, China, these are countries which had phenomenal savings ratios. So Japan was built on 30% saving. Yeah. Much of the Chinese miracle is based upon 50% yeah. savings. So they internally generate the foregone consumption to invest in the creation of new assets. Yeah. All those factories, etc., cities, etc., are new assets. Of course, they haven't paid for the pollution they've caused in the process, but yeah. that's an aside. And off it goes. Yeah. The flow of those savings to the developed countries, the US, Europe, and ourselves, is basically these countries sold the stuff to us and then lent us the money to pay yeah. for it. Yeah. That's why uh, Japan and China ended up being the biggest holders of US Treasury bonds. Right? You can't keep that going. No, and right? nor should you. I mean, that's the problem. Why are, we, why are they not investing in things yeah. which have a genuine real return? Yeah. Both the Chinese yeah. and ourselves. Yeah. And so in it's the book, the, what I say yeah. is, if you really want to make this work, and you really want to take the next generation into account, you have to think about the political structures to make that happen. Indeed. And that's why I have the last chapter, which is one of the, in the sense of intellectually supported weakest chapter of the book, but the most important, which is on the constitution mm. of the sustainable economy and how the interests of the next generation mm. are locked into the decision making we make at the moment. Because there are lots of people going, you know, going to be the next generation in this room, or their children are going to be, and they have no say in what we're dumping upon them. And not just the climate change and the biodiversity loss. So forgive me, I'm going to interrupt this fascinating conversation and ask for questions from the audience. Um, w one thing just to remind you, we are being recorded, so bear that in mind when you ask a question. And if you could just wait until a microphone gets to you before you answer a question. So we have one over there, Clara, and I will ask some questions from the online audience. Um, you pick, Clara. I'll go down there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm interested in agency, you know, um, how is this change going to happen? And to make this a simple question, I'm going to give you three examples. Extinction Rebellion as a social movement, um, Starmer's Labour Party, and the dot-com billionaires like Musk. You know, what is the agency in these people? My goodness, if we rely on any of those three, we've <laughs> had it, right? Um, no, I don't mean it that one, but quite strongly. So, so on the Extinction Rebellions and the Just Stop Oil, this will be an unpopular view with some. I think they're positively dangerous. Just Stop Oil is a simplistic answer which would be devastating if their recommendation was implemented. And it also 
uh, often these arguments are based on the idea that if you glue yourself to some nasty oil company and the oil company changes its way, all will be fine. What this does is forget agency. We buy the stuff. Yeah. We are the polluters. We need to change our ways. And uh, I always ask people um, when they... Uh, and I, I, I admire the spirit and the idealism, no doubt whatsoever. I've probably got more grey hair now to have uh, dampened some of my optimism that I once had in that sense. But I always ask, so how do you live? And in my Net Zero book, I ask people to fill in their carbon diary and write down how much carbon they think is in their choices per day. So I don't fly. It's about the, apart from my virtue signaling with the car, that's my other bit of virtual signaling. But when you see a whole group of people outside demonstrating an oil company, if you do a, a little check, where are you spending your summer holiday? Where are you flying to? They don't think it's got anything to do with what they do. They think it's got to do with what those companies do. Not completely. Some of them change their diet, do all sorts of other things. Some of them are limited in what they do. But I, I think that's not going to get us there. And there's no evidence it's persuading the public either. On the other alternative, if we have to rely on a small number of billionaires to shape our future, then not only have we given up on democracy and constitutions and introducing a sensible framework of institutions, but we're also extremely exposed to their particular fads Absolutely. and interests. So Mr. Musk is very happy to uh, spend money flying rockets to colonize Mars, um, when actually uh, at least Bill Gates is interested in dealing with something malaria. But the idea that individuals have more power than governments is a very, very dangerous point. As for Mr. Starmer's Labour Party, I, I'm not political in these things, but I don't detect any willingness to genuinely engage with the agenda I put forward. I don't think the Conservatives do either, so it's not a particularly <laughs> political point. Their particular difficulty is that, like the Conservatives, if they win the next election, or the Labour Party wins the next election, they are inheriting consequences of 25 years of zero or negative real interest rates and the debt that goes with it. And as an aside, just as a kind of aside, you did an interesting question, what is the point of a social democratic government with no money to spend? You know, in a sense, both are going to be advertise, advertising some form of austerity uh, going forward. So if I thought that those, any of those groups could crack this problem, I would not have that how, to end, how it ends slide with the notion that actually we're quite likely to go on in this unsustainable fashion for quite some considerable time before we're forced onto a path. Um, thank you. We'll go one there, and then there are a couple of questions right at the back. And as you go to the back, I'll ask one from online. Dieter, thank you. I work in energy R&D across a range of uh, sectors. If I think about the decarbonization of transport, mm -hmm. it's looking very much like we're going to need, well, we will enjoy EHGVs. For maritime, no matter what route we go down, we will need more electrical power mm -hmm. to fund that. Mm -hmm. That makes ports, multimodal locations, mm -hmm. where from a national economic perspective, we need to invest mm -hmm. sooner rather than later in hundreds of megawatts of more electrical yeah. power. Yeah, agreed. How can we do that? Bearing in mind, it seems to be falling between the gaps departmentally and government level. Mm. Where does that fit into your model? And then how can we help other countries do the same? Okay, so first of all, when I talk about the systems the next generation have to inherit, I do give primacy to uh, a decent climate and biodiversity. But I do think these other physical infrastructures are important for the future generation to inherit. And indeed, they're essential for doing the environmental things that we want to do. That's the first thing. The second thing, and it's a major part of my work and in the book, these are all systems, okay? And the idea you can think about these systems as discrete projects and apply cost-benefit analysis to them is utter nonsense, right? You know, you need a grid, right? You need a system, an energy system yeah. designed for decentralized generation. These networks have to be built ahead of demand, right? Our approach is precisely the opposite. Five-year period reviews, off-gem regulation, discrete 
cost-benefit analysis of each project, okay? It ain't gonna work. And to the credit, I mean, this is not a political point, again, but to the credit of the Prime Minister's speech when he talked about slowing down on the targets, which, by the way, I think is, we're never gonna achieve them anyway in the previous frame, to the side, uh, you can read what you like into the intentionality of this, but the most important part of his speech was, we need to really get on with the grid, okay? Now, what you're describing is a doubling of electricity capacity in the UK by, what, 240? This is huge, right? And that cannot be done in a discrete company-by-company company basis. Companies can do this stuff, but you need a spatial plan for the networks, and you need the capacity to ensure that the networks as public goods are put in place. And that isn't, again, something the private sector can do on its own. It can raise the money, it can do the investment, but someone else So I've advocated for catchments, so think of Thames, et cetera, and for electricity, and I actually think this is appropriate for fiber and broadband, that we replace the economic regulatory system we have at the moment with system regulation. And when I did the cost of energy review for the government in 2017, system regulation was absolutely essential to this system planning. Good news, we are gonna set up a future system operator in a matter of days, and there will be a strategic plan. Whether it's up to the job, and whether people realize how much it's going to cost. So back to this point, it's not a free lunch to move from the current system to a new system. There's a huge amount of money that has to be spent to get from here to there. So the real question is, do you approach this by saying, we'll do what we can, we believe that this is all cheaper than fossil fuels, and what we'll do is we'll do what we can as long as bills don't go up. That's pretty much the policy position of at least one major political party or not the other. Or do you say, this is what we have to do, and it will cost whatever it costs? And I make the comparison between thinking you're in 1936 and you need, you've got a peacetime economy and you want to win the Battle of Britain in, 1940, in 1941. Do you say, let's let the market forces think about which plane they should invest in? Do you think we should just let companies work out, where should we have an airstrip, do you think? And we'll have competing infrastructure, competing things. Or do you say, it's too urgent? Some things just have to be planned. It has to go here, you have to do these, and you have to pay for it. I think you have to do the latter. That's why I'm skeptical, and I have a paper on the website, uh, that um, my view is we're not gonna hit 235 for decarbonizing the electricity system on the current uh, program. In fact, I think we're gonna be considerably far off. But what we need to do, back to what um, Dimitri was saying, it's not rocket science. This is pretty straightforward. But you've gotta pay for it. And that goes to the heart of what I'm saying about sustainable consumption, investment, and so on. So I'm, I'm going to take a question from online. Perhaps I'll go to Dimitri first That's and good. then uh, Dieter. It's from Neil McCulloch. Uh, where is the politics in all this? How can we feasibly move to a world in which citizens vote to move to more sustainable consumption? So how? I mean, that's a very good and a very interesting question. I, I, I guess there's two ways. Um, Two ways I'd like to approach it. One is a sort of generic point, which goes back to the sort of mood and, and optimism. And, and then another, which is kind of a question to Dieter, actually, um, about the politics of some of his proposals, which I think are valid proposals. Um, but I'm interested in how he intends to frame them in the, uh, in the real political economy. So the first point is, and I think, Dieter, you're right. It does sound you know, a little self-indulgent to talk about kind of whether or not we as individuals are optimistic uh, or not. But I think one of the ways in which uh, it's important to galvanize uh, behavior is, and, and bear with me for a moment, is to sell this as self-interest as opportunity. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, and this is one of the things that the French did, I mean, I, I'm as skeptical as Dieter is about COPs, but one of the things the French did at the Paris COP in 2015 was they changed the narrative from burden sharing it's all about cost and rolling mm. up your sleeves and all the rest of it, which of course led to free riding and a race to the bottom because everybody waited for somebody else to act, to the language of voluntary contributions, opportunities, uh, and, uh, and self-interest. You know, whether it's you want to reduce particulate pollution in your cities or reduce congestion by um, you know, uh, investing in public transport or, or just fabricating and exporting the kit if you're China, um, you have reasons, what vested reasons, why you want to, might want to start decarbonizing 
that generate returns within a political time frame of five or so years rather than talking about grandchildren and so on. That helps motivate decisions. And going back to the conditional optimism story, and this is my point when I say economists not only get the future wrong, they make the future wrong. If we tell a horrific story about eye-watering costs um, that, that, that you know, will last forever, um, then of course, you know, if you're a mayor or a politician or a business investor or, or, you know, uh, or, or even a consumer, and you're thinking of investing in some new clean technology, are you likely to invest in it if you're told it's eye-wateringly expensive, the finance is niche, and there's no growth market? Answer, probably not, right? If, on the other hand, you're told that the, the costs are coming down very sharply, um, the finance is becoming mainstream, and this is one of the fastest growing sectors in the world, are you likely to invest? Well, probably more likely. And you could even be a steel or cement producer who might think, look, if I'm going to stay viable in the future, I'm going to be best in class in terms of efficiency and emissions. Now, here's the trick. The very act of investing, as we said already, is the thing that starts to bring the cost down. So there's an element of self-fulfilling prophecy in moods, in mm. optimism, and mm. so on. Now, obviously, if, if the engineering and the science doesn't back it up, then it becomes one giant mm. Ponzi mm. scheme. But actually, and this is where I do differ fundamentally with, with Dieter, if you look at, I mean, you were right, 80% of the world's energy generation is still fossil fuel based. But that 20% is now renewable, and that's happened very quickly. Over the last decade or so, the world has invested more in renewables than in oil, uh, gas, and coal put together for electricity generation. Um, the flow into that stock is very heavily renewables-based, and that's because it is still cheap. Now, of course, the more penetration you get of renewables, the, the bigger the intermittency and grid balancing uh, obstacles become. But there are you know, scientific fixes for that as well um, that we're seeing. And even more broadly, if you look at energy in general, Last year, for the first time, there was a trillion dollars, roughly, of investment in uh, renewable energy, uh, which is about the same as went into fossil fuel. So one is displacing the other. It's not all additional cost. You know, for every uh, renewable technology you have to build, you might have to build fewer you know, oil rigs, mines, refineries, railways, and ports. You might not if you need the raw materials to build the batteries. You're absolutely right to talk about the broader consequences. But you, know, you need to look at the broader consequences to get a sense of this balance. And I'm getting, you know, it's certainly, if you look at, how much we have achieved in two non-trivial sectors, energy generation and vehicles. It's very easy for people to roll their eyes and go, oh, no, they, they're the easy bits. That's not what we were told 10 years ago. You know, there was a, you know, 10 years ago, if you'd said that you even had a discussion mm -hmm. about whether renewables would be competitive with fossil fuels, it would have been kind of escorted out of the building you know, by security. It would have been laughable. Uh, you know, electric vehicles were purely playthings for the rich. And now there's, not, there's no serious auto manufacturer that's investing R&D into the combustion engine. That's yesterday's technology. Mm. So if you think of just how little effort society has put into generating uh, these changes, we've gone nowhere near spending the 1% of GDP that advocates talk about. You know, our policy effort's been pathetic. And yet suddenly, within the space of a decade, we are decarbonizing our energy system and we are changing from combustion engines to electric vehicles. That's quite phenomenal. Just think what we could achieve if we seriously put our mind to it. Now, that's not to say it comes for free. You know, as you went from horse and carts to the Ford Model T, a huge amount of investment went into not just combustion engine vehicles, but refineries and uh, petrol stations and roads and all the rest of it. But nobody in their right mind stands up and says, well, actually, that was so expensive, we should have stuck with horse and carts. Mm -hmm. Of course, these transitions cost money. But you've got to sell a positive and optimistic story that says, you know, if we're going to get to the, that place, um, how do we saddle the upfront costs, which are not just investment, they're also, um, you know, they're also societal. And this is my question to, to Dieter. Because I was drawn to your you know, world of the uh, you know, universal, in, uh, the modified basic income uh, and the dividends payment, the flat rate tax. Mm -hmm. uh, you would not design a tax system from where we are. Uh, you would want yeah. to, if you could start from scratch, you'd start with that and then start modifying it for all the kind of tweaks yeah. that you need to make. But how much did you do? Were you seriously uh, presenting that as something that uh, any political party would consider? Or were you presenting okay. that as a hypothetical? Because, of course, the change would be so large and so disruptive right. that it would be so political suicide. Dieter, so, Dieter, so the answer is... Dieter, I'm going to ask you to be quite brief. Sorry, that was too long. One more question yes. then. So, sorry, so, I will so, shut so up. So the answer is... No problem. The question I addressed was, what would the sustainable economy look like? At no point did I say we were going to go to it. Right? <laughs> That's very important, OK? Yes. okay? So I am yes. practically very yes. interested in that yes. question. Yes. Um, as an aside, the 80%, 20%, don't overstate it. 
because of the remaining 20%, a big chunk is nuclear and a big chunk is hydro dams, really big. The, the renewables bit on the top is really small. It's, it's, in, it's a fantastic achievement to double it. If you've got one wind turbine and you have two, you've doubled it, right? The amount that you've got to do to really decarbonize is huge. Right? And we may we be have... looking at different numbers. I no, okay, well, so... okay, but I think it's really important to realize just how big the remaining bit is. And there's no evidence whatsoever. And we're not the main causer of climate change anymore. There's no evidence whatsoever that uh, uh, countries which really are pushing on the emissions are cutting into this frame. Just a quick observation. China's put more carbon in the atmosphere in the last eight years than the UK has since 1750. You know, you've got to get these numbers into proportion. But it is a very big country. No, very big. No, no, just quickly the answer to the question. First of all, I don't believe in telling lies. So I believe in telling the public the truth about what you think the costs are going to be and not deliberately trying to tell people it isn't going to cost them when it is, because they find out. Mm -hmm. And I think the reaction yeah. in Germany, the AFD, yeah. the reaction in the Netherlands, the reaction actually the farmers in uh, elsewhere, and the reaction here in the UK and the threat to the net zero program that comes when people find out it isn't true yeah. is really difficult. The second thing is low-hanging fruit. So go for the new no regrets things first. There are quite a lot of stuff mm. in the things you describe, etc., which we should go for and do, and they're not going to cost very much. But and, uh, in that frame, address that. And then finally, I do come back to my last chapter. You will have to have constitutional change because I don't believe our democracies are up to the job of tackling these problems without constitutional change. America has a constitution which protects individual rights. We could have a constitution which protects the interests of the next generation. Peter, I think I'm going vital. to interrupt you there because I love you. One the last book. question, and if it could be very brief, please. I'll try and squeeze in. Um, so I actually wanted to ask a question. You, you said in your presentation um, something about not having to cost or price nature yes. into perpetuity because you don't yes. sell it. Yes. But obviously, I mean, I would love it if we lived in a world where we didn't have to sell nature, except just by fundamentally kind of living and eating, obviously natural resources need no, to be no, used. No, no, no. Um, and so, so I was just wondering okay. how you... So you um, mis misinterpreted uh, my, what uh, I said, and that's and my And I, I also just wanted to push back on your uh, kind of pushing everything onto the consumer. And of course, I totally agree that, you know, we do buy this stuff and, and we do want cheap food. But is there, not, is there not a false dichotomy there and that it is also, uh, you know, producers are also profit maximizing and potentially they okay. have the greatest power and resources to Forgive create me. change at scale? Forgive yeah. me, I have to stop you there because we do need to finish. Dieter, so, just a so quick response. Quick, quick answer. So the last bit, okay, if you want to change the behavior of industry, great. You'll probably increase their costs and that'll increase your bills. If you're worried about profits, profits go to individuals. There's no such thing as corporate profits staying in corporations in perpetuity. Ultimately, the value of a company is the discounted value of the future stream of dividends. So if you're worried about those, tax them. Right? Tax those individuals who receive that, if that's your concern. Okay? On the valuing nature, what I'm concerned about is people who say, oh, this riverbank's worth £562.48, pence, and the primrose is worth mm. 462 because yeah. we've asked people what they're willing to pay for protecting yeah. it. The only things that you have to value is you have to value what the capital maintenance costs, yeah. what it costs to maintain that asset intact, and of course you do a valuation when you do a new enhancement. Yeah. But nobody comes along to be about and says, what's your nature reserve worth? Because yeah. it's a trust in perpetuity. Mm. And that's a model which you might want to think going forward. But they do say, how much does it cost be about to maintain that hay meadow at Chimney Meadow? Uh, which is wonderful, by the way, just outside Bampton, a good advert for bee about. And they do ask too, how much money do we need to raise to put some new environmental asset in place. That's what you value. Yeah. But this idea that all of nature, you these assets value. all have to be valued, and we need a balance sheet of the asset value of nature, yeah. this is nonsense. Yeah. And the ONS try and calculate this, so they end up with the idea that nature, natural capital, is worth significantly less by an order of magnitude than the housing stock in Britain. Mm -hmm. How could that be true? And it's mostly oil and gas under the North Sea. Yeah. 
Forgive me, I'm going to have to stop this. Sorry, we could, but, and, uh, we could very much have gone on to age. Just before, uh, uh, in a moment, I'll ask you to thank our speakers. Before I do that, uh, we have another talk tomorrow, actually, about Ackham Steiner. Ackham is the head of the United Nations, the UNDP, the United Nations Development Programme, and he will be here in conversation with Valerie Amos, Baroness uh, Amos, and, and that's the same time tomorrow. Um, we have some wine next door, and I should uh, reassure my economist friends here that, this, that the wine is not debt fueled consumption, it's strategic investment in social capital. Good. Good. It's not so, a free lunch. Can I just add one, one point? Um, I just wanted to say the book is open access, so it doesn't cost you anything to download it, and it's, it's open access so as many students can read it as possible. So, so I was about to say that, that, and in the next door there will be flyers which will give you instructions and how to do that. Um, Dimitri and Dieter, it has been a privilege to sit in on such a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much and it's really important work that you're doing. Thank you.